our deal right now is like, you know, we're, we're not weighing so much on like, what's your degree and how many initials do you have behind your name and those sorts of things. It's like, do you have a really good work ethic and are you a good person? And if you have those two things, like you're gonna fit pretty well within our culture. Casey Kelly, ladies and gentlemen, how you doing, buddy? Doing good, buddy. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are things in uh, Butte, Montana today? Oh, we got another weather system rolling through. No more uh, balloons from China, thank God. So we're doing all right. <laughs> can you shoot those down yourself, like from your yard? Do you have to get a license for that, or can you just go out there and start sure, shooting? I'm pretty sure they were in a few people's scopes, but uh, I can either confirm or deny that. So. I could think like, well, I'm from Texas. And if it floats over either Texas and probably Montana, there's going to be guys shooting at it. Come on. Like, if those, are some, <laughs> no <doubt. laughs> those are some pretty big hunting Get out states. of our space. Yeah, uh, no doubt. Yeah, exactly. Well, listen, um, thanks for coming on. Um, I wanted to have you on because I think you're in a unique situation, right? You're a success story, but it didn't come without its lumps. And I think it would be good for anybody that's thinking about an alloy or just even entrepreneurs overall, like, you know, you're, you've done a good job of managing your business from afar. Um, we often use these terms in franchising. It's like absentee ownership, which I'm just going to say right now is bullshit. Like there's no such thing as a fully absentee business. If you want that invest in stocks or crypto or whatever the heck you're into. But then there's the next sure. kind of in between betweener, which is semi absentee. And I think that leaves a lot of room for interpretation. Right. And then there's like right. full on, I'm going to work in my business every day. And most of the people that are interested in buying an alloy are kind of where you are. They're like at the investor level. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think, it would be good just to hear the story overall. So um, let's just take a step back. Like you were unique in the sense that you had been in the fitness space before. So give us a little bit of your background. I know you played college football. Like how'd you get into the fitness industry? You know, I, I got my mechanical engineering degree um, and played some football during that time. Um, and so I worked in that capacity for about 10 years, you know, doing corporate gigs, um, you know, kind of industrial process controls and chemical type engineering and you know, just got disenchanted with sort of the the roles that I had found myself in, just routine production type of stuff. And, you know, really got bored with it. And, uh, you know, just really had a knack and a passion for for fitness overall. You know, again, being a former athlete and having to do that through college. Um, and during that time, I had a, a good friend uh, who you're familiar with, Dan Kleckner, um, that was running a, a gym out in Seattle with his brother. And I had kind of followed and seen what they were doing out in that direction. And, um, really just thought it was an awesome concept and, you know, sort of the studio stuff was coming on the scene then, and there wasn't a whole lot of gyms that offered that around here. So, you know, I had approached him and just thought, you know, what if we tried to to get something like that going here? And I had considered it to just maybe be like a part-time side hustle type of, of uh, you know, facility. And, you know, eventually found out that <laughs> there's a lot more that goes into running a gym, right? And so um, ended up transitioning, you know, fully out of engineering uh, back in 2017 and, you know, went into this personal training industry um, and had a little bit of experience, you know, during that engineering time where I was just doing some one-on-one -on -one training as sort of a hobby just to get some exposure to it. Do I really like this, you know, being on my feet in front of people? I mean, the the perception of, you know, training people is a lot different than the reality of it, right? You right. Know, people think we just wear sweatpants all day and just, you know, <laughs> work out all the time and we just take care of ourselves and super That's simple, right. easy job. It's it's totally different, right? So anyways, we together started a, a brand here in my hometown um, and ran that for, you know, the prior five years to coming on with Alloy. Um, that's where you and I had developed sort of a relationship together, a little bit of consulting and advising to maybe how we should set the gym up. Um, and so it was, you know, a hybrid concept where we did do some small group training as well as the, you know, the team training that, you know, Orange Theory and F45 and all of them run. And so kind of had this hybrid model. Um, and we ran a lot of different stuff in there. We tried semi-private. We tried sort of a, a larger small group of eight to 10 and, you know, really just mixed and matched and threw darts at, at, just to see what worked, what didn't work. And man, when you're running your own, gig and you're coming up with your own cockamamie ideas, it can get, you know, convoluted pretty quickly, right? With all the different memberships <laughs> and programming styles and things like that. So, um, you know, when you had moved into franchising, uh, I think I remember you started with the Stronger 2 model and it just wasn't quite a, you know, realistic investment. And uh, we didn't quite have the market sizes, you know, nearby that would be conducive to running something like that. And so, you know, once you had transitioned to the stronger one, I think that's where I had approached you and um, just 
really enjoyed the concept of, you know, um, focusing on one service, one product, um, and being the best at that. And honestly, I'm a firm believer in, you know, the, the smaller, um, format and more, um, strength training based workouts versus these high intensity things. So, I mean, we ran the groups because we had to, it was popular <laughs> and that's just right. kind of fit our market. But, uh, at the end of the day, you know, I want to believe in what we're selling and that's kind of what, what allies brought. So that's where we, you know, transitioned, you know, to, to this, uh, franchise model with you. You know, it was interesting because when we first, when you first reached out, obviously I knew you from, like you said, our business relationship. Um, you were part of a coaching group that we had, you know, you were a good operator um, and you were like, Hey, I want to we'll look at an alloy. I'm like, Oh, great. You know, good guy, smart guy. I'm like, sure. And we ran the demographics and, you know, we're pretty specific as you know, with these demos. So we looked at Butte and I'm like, I'm oh, man, it's going to be tight, you know, to do this. And you knew that because you were running to your point, this hybrid model and the price threshold is really what kind of pushes us into certain markets. Right. So it was like, yeah, Butte would be tough. And you're like, well, what about billings? Which for anybody listening, that's like a three hour drive, I think from you. Um, right. Sure. And I'm like, well, I don't know, like three hours away, that's a long way. Like, how are you going to do that? And you're like, well, I'm going to hire an operator. I'm going to be, you know, you know, per our terms, like I'm going to be a semi absentee owner. Right. And so I'm like, all right, I trusted you. I figured we would give it a go. You know, it's, I, I knew that you didn't plan on servicing revenue going in there and training. That's sort of the same setup as the rest of our, most of our franchisees are, we would call like at the investor level, right? Where they're not going to actually work in their facilities. They're going to have to hire somebody. Um, right. Things went pretty well. You know, we, we looked at billings that would support an alloy. We ran the demographics. It worked well. We got good lease. Like all that stuff worked out pretty well. Um, you know, you, you identified in a couple of different candidates. You hired an operator. Um came to training in Atlanta. Um, you know, we had you and your operator over for dinner. Everything looked really good. Um, but it didn't go without its lumps. So feel free to, to share your, your story just because I think it's a good cautionary tale, but ultimately it's going to end up being a, a real good success story. But I think it's worth telling. I mean, put it this way. I tell this story when I talk to other people, when I say, what are you going to have to be willing to do to support your own business? I'm like, this is what could happen to you. So in your own words, just share, you know, what kind of what happened. When we went down this path, right, it's I think that the two things that, you know, we identified that we're going to make the successful were the location and the operator, right? Those are the two most critical components, right? And so we knew that you guys had the, you know, sort of the demographic models and, you know, you'd run the, the checks on, you know, where these things would actually be a fit based on consumer behaviors and those sorts of things. And so we trusted that the model, you know, would put us in the correct location. Well, then that left the variable of finding the correct operator, right? And um, I didn't have anybody, you know, in mind in that Billings market. And that was my concern going in, right? So that's where we got put um, in touch with your um, staffing agency, or at least the one you have a, a relationship with. And so Jessie was great. She found us some candidates. Um Ended up getting a couple dozen, you know, that at least initially fit the bill. And then we had whittled that down to, you know, two that we really liked um, that were already local to the area, had some sales experience, um, really just kind of fit the overall profile of of who this person would be, right? Using that best works data and everything else. So we we ran Mm -hmm. the overlays. We tried to do as much diligence as we could. We weren't like in a super big hurry to hire this operator and um, ended up landing on a guy and. Um, like you said, we went through the training process um, and, and thought all systems were a go. Well, um, when we had opened, right, we'd already gone through the pre-sales um, together and, you know, really just tracking the numbers. It looked like we were hitting our metrics and goals. And, you know, I think our target, as every location is, is somewhere in that neighborhood of 130 people. And right. I think by my count, we were on a 124 with, you know, a couple dozen that were sort of non-responsive to our messages. So we figured, we're, you know, there's going to be a little bit of churn early on. Um, sure. But uh, anyways, we had gotten through our, our grand opening party that Saturday, went to go ahead and, and run the cards on Monday and ended up with, I think the, the final tally was about 52 people. Mm-hmm. 22 had processed that morning. We were able to track down like another 30 people after the fact. So uh, we had some really, you know, big hiccups early on in the process. And, and part of this was just um, maybe a lack of understanding how the systems were all connected and working together. You know, we were 
instructed to, you know, get our um, credit cards on file, you know, with these uh, pre-sales sales we're making as well as like a, you know, contract. And because we didn't have the physical location yet, we were trying to get an electronic signature and somewhere in the fray, we ended up, you know, not collecting that information. And that was unknown to me at the time. And after <laughs> a couple of weeks of running spreadsheets and trying to figure out what the hell happened, um, you know, found that there was just a, a miscommunication, some lack of follow through. Right. So we ended up, you know, half of, of where we thought we were going to be. Um, and for us, the break even was around that 63 to 65 people. Um, based mm-hmm. on the membership prices that we have. And so being at 52, you know, we knew we were close. There was a little bit of cash that we had to burn up front. Um, and after, you know, a couple months, we were able to thankfully climb out of that hole and uh, ended up, you know, replacing our original director with a new guy um, that had worked for me in the other brand um, that I took over. And he's, you know, been doing a fantastic job ever since. So continually steadily grown from there um to a much better place now we're we're a little over a year old and um but yeah those those early months were a little stressful and uh just kind of got um, much but such is the life of an entrepreneur exactly and listen i think even with all of that you know even though we might have had you, you had somebody in there that maybe wasn't crossing all their t's and dotting all their i's um mm-hmm. but you remedied that. And, you know, again, if you're talking about two months to break even, even with that, right, it's still a good, mm-hmm. it's a good story, right? Because it, it, oh, I think most sure. businesses, it takes a while. It's like, hey, I'm at break even. Um, you're full now, which is great. And so it's like, you know, yeah, it took a while. But like you said, if you're profitable, I think you said at 63 or 64 in your particular case, um, didn't take long to get there, even with the hiccup. So let's talk sure. about like that, um, that time period. So, I mean, I, I think, you know, for anyone listening to this, that's a candidate or or what have you, this would be like worst case scenario, right? It's like, okay, I got the right spot. I know it's, it's my prerogative. I got to hire the right person. I got to lead them correctly or whatever. I put this person in there and they kind of drop the ball. Okay, cool. Now, all that being said, um, I think in that worst case scenario is how much time during that tumultuous time, I mean, it's three hours away. You got to get in your truck. You got to drive three hours. You've got to go there and fix it. You got to hire somebody new, you know, or pull somebody out of, of, a, of your local market, put them there, whatever that is. How much time do you think you were devoting weekly to the business during that tumultuous time? Oh, well, I mean, it was uh, all hands on deck at that point, right? I mean, just trying to put out the flames and run assist as much as humanly possible. So, I mean, in that few week period of, of where we were making the transition, I'd say that probably took us Oh, three to four weeks to make that transition, which mm-hmm. was a really accelerated timeline. And I just happened to be in the fortunate position to have another guy that was on the wings, ready to go, had the motivation, had the ability to be mobile because he was single and had no kids. Um, so really lucky in that regard. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was making, you know, trips over there just about every week, a couple of days at a time. Um, for those few weeks, just to, again, help out, make sure everything was buttoned up and dialed in, um, you know, and again, family life and being three hours away, not always simple to, to right. organize kids and schedules and things. So, um, you know, hopefully that wouldn't be the case with any more going forward, you know, because now I think there's some more safeguards that, you know, we're verifying these things as as we're progressing along and, and not blindly yeah, trusting. You could pull the, pull the plug quicker, right? Make that change a little bit quicker. Yeah, for sure. If, if yeah. in fact that happened, because listen, I mean, you did everything right there. You can cross all your T's and dot all your I's and you just still, somebody can slip through the cracks and fool you. And so when I'm talking to potential franchisees, I'm saying my expectation is if, you know, we've got full transparency, we can listen to calls, we can see response times. If your pre-sale starts and someone's not showing up like they should, we're going to point you towards it. I need these folks to pay attention. If they do, my expectation is that you will make changes in your business, which I know sounds like a silly thing to have to like remind somebody of yeah. like it's your business, you're going to have to make changes, but I think it's worth saying. So for you being three hours away, even more difficult. So to know that it took three to four weeks, disruptive, but still not that long, quite honestly, in the bigger scope of things. Right. So all hands on deck at during that time. Now, once you got your new operator in place and things were going, how many hours a week would you estimate that you were putting into the business? And speaking to it, like, again, I'm, I'm thinking of somebody listening to this, Casey, that's like, 
I want to be a semi absentee owner. What's a realistic, like say first four to six months of the business? Maybe they don't lose their operator and maybe their, their, their uh, facility is close by, right? So they can right. make things happen a little easier. What would that, a fair expectation in your estimation be for hours per week to invest? Yeah. So, I mean, again, there's, there's different time periods, I think, to this whole thing. I mean, as we were going into like the build out phase, it was only, you know, maybe a couple hours a week just to, to keep eyes on numbers and maybe communicate with like the construction firms and those sorts of things. As uh, training and pre-sales started ramping up, that's where I felt my involvement became a lot, you know, more into the businesses because I was helping out with, um, you know, the sales pipeline, making phone calls, making sure people were followed up with you know, helping remind my director that he had some calls coming up, checking in to see how those calls went, talking about the conversations that we're having. So, you know, my experience is a little different just because I've had those conversations in the past and know what the sales process is is like and and more hands-on in the business in that regard. Whereas, you know, maybe some investor owners may not want to be as involved, in which case I would say it would be good to at least maybe get another you know, part-time employee in there to help out during that time. I think it should should be at least two people, you know, running that pre-sales process just because <laughs> there's a lot going on. The leads are coming fast. And right. I don't want to, you know, drop the opportunity there. So, you know, pre-sales, again, more involvement. And because of the the hiccups um, and having to, to make that change out, you know, again, another you know, 15, 20 hours a week there. Um, I'd say it was probably, yeah, maybe 20 to 30 during the pre-sales time frame. And then, you know, really once we've gotten up to speed and, and we felt comfortable that our, you know, month over month we were growing, we're now profitable. Um, and we, we feel like everybody knows their roles and responsibilities. Um, you know, it's it could be as little as, you know, two to, to three hours a week or less. I mean, just depending on how much you want to do now by choice, I feel like I want to be more involved and help dial in our systems a little bit more, make sure I'm holding them accountable, those sorts of things. So I'm probably, you know, putting in, you know, three hours a day right now or more, you know, help and send emails and those sorts of things. But uh, honestly, I think you could really cut that down to, to two or less if you really needed to. That's great. So what I'm hearing is like, you need to be available, mm-hmm. right? when it and there's there's like there's like flurries of activity and then it's slow and then flurries so you sign the franchise agreement real estate and everything there's not too much to do during that time right and then but once the pre-sale starts if you're in your case you were that second person so if they have two people they're probably not working that many hours and then one thing that we've added that that you probably know about or maybe not is we've got like a internal sales team now that folks can hire and we can handle all your phone pre-sales. So it's like, why not have a hit team that's really good at that particular function? For sure, and that way absolutely. it gives you all this bandwidth, right? So you don't have to take all those leads and stuff. So that's been in place since you came on because you were one of the early um, early franchisees. But then after that, you can power down, but it's going to take some time. And what I want people to hear, and I'm glad that you explained it that way with these time frames, is that like there are times in the business where you're going to need to show up, right? At least show up for the meetings. Show your team that you're present. Like that's something you've done really well is because you've got a, a guy and Paul's a young man, but he's so good, right? He's so good at what he does. But one thing that you do well, just giving you some props from where I sit, is you show up for him. Like you're there. He knows fully that he's on a team, that you've, you're have you there to support him, that you appreciate him, you know, and you've got his back. And I think that almost just showing up in that way is maybe the most important thing. Would you agree? Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. I think, I mean, it's, it's uh, trying to set a culture, right. Of, of accountability and, and um, support. Right. So I, I, the way I view it is all works for the clients and I work for Paul. Right. So I'm trying to support Paul with whatever he needs. Hey, I'm not going to ghost you. So for example, this week, Paul's out on travel and uh, God bless him. He's, he's out skiing. And uh, I'm stepping in to take over his um, duties for lead follow-up and and sort of the phone sales conversations. Now, I can't run the physical starting points because I'm three, three hours away, but I'm going to try and book them in for him next week. And that's pretty rare. You know, obviously, he's not traveling year-round, but um, in those occasional opportunities, I'll step in and help him out. Well, listen, that's... Uh... I think that's key. And I'm, I'm glad anyone that's uh, that's listening will hear that. It's like, look... Um, you know, that, that's what you do. Like it's servant leadership, right? Uh, I haven't heard it articulated that way. I thought that was really cool. So for anybody that didn't hear it, I'll reiterate it on Casey's behalf. Um, you know, 
Paul services the clients and Casey, who's the investor, services Paul. I mean, talking about servant leadership, that's why the best pecking order and the best way to, to describe it that I've heard, right? Which is awesome. So, well, let's look, your facility's full now. Um, we both know that we're waiting on the state of Washington to get off their butts. I mean, <laughs> for those of you guys that don't know, there are states that make you register for franchising. Some of them are very difficult. And the most difficult ones are typically, as you can imagine, like California, New York, right? They make it a little harder to be franchise business. We've got approval from every state except for the state of Washington. And <laughs> as soon as they do, as far as I understand, you know, you want you and Paul as a, as a group will stabilize the Billings Club and then you want to move over into Spokane, Washington. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, that, that's the vision. I mean, he's a northern Idaho guy. He's from um, Sandpoint, Idaho, which is maybe an hour or so from Spokane. So getting a little bit closer to his family. Um, but, yeah, we've been obviously waiting on that for a few months now. Hopeful that that will progress and come, you know, yep. sooner rather than later. But uh, I think, yeah, you're, to your point, um, the the vision is to uh, move Paul over there. You know, somebody who's got really good experience now can take that to the new club with him. He gets to build that from the ground up and make it his own facility. And then we'll just, you know, maybe have a transitionary period where somebody's, you know, shadowing him and following him around the club and, and getting the good hands-on experience to be able to to take the reins there in an already established location. Awesome. So things work out perfectly for you. What does it look like with you and Alloy in five years? Oh, re really relevant question because we've gone through the uh, EOS training and had to yeah, uh, workshop this the other day. But, um, you know, I think it's, it's kind of a little bit of a moving target, but I think um, we're still kind of in alignment with what our original vision was, was to, to get some regional um, location set up, maybe three to five of them. Again, I think the ones that are, that are going to be within an arm's reach are going to be um, kind of the ones that we target just because I'd like to be able to to get to them a little easier if I can. Um, now, down the road, that may change. Um, we could target 10 clubs, who knows, but I think uh, the very first one obviously is the most critical. And then, um, you know, we want to maybe grab a couple more here, you know, and that's by design, um, obviously, the more locations that we have, the more people that we can help, right? So there's that aspect of it. But it's also going to allow us to add some more opportunity and layers, you know, for, you know, our operators to, to move around within the, the company a little bit too, right? You could hire a regional director or, or manager. And um, that's kind of the vision right now for, for Paul and I is to, you know, give him the good experience. You know, we don't know what that timeline is exactly, but... Um, if he kicks butt in his role as the operator and really understands the operations, you know, from the ground level, you know, now he can be much more effective to you know, take over some clubs and, and really, you know, support them. Yeah, I think that's great. One of our um, franchisees that, you know, John Farkas, he's in St. Louis and he's purchased four locations and he's he's drafted this sort of vision. You know, his his fiance, Alicia, does a lot of our graphics work for Alloy. She's awesome. Mm -hmm. And she helped him build this sort of vision sheet. It's maybe, I mean, shoot, reach out to him. He might even share it with you where, you know, when he has, when he's bringing someone in, he's able to say, like, here's where we are as an organization in three or four years. But what he mentioned was, and you'll experience this as well, is that the the level of talent that he's able to attract now with a bigger vision is so much different than it was one location, right? Because everyone, I think, comes to him and they say, wow, you know, his vision is big enough for our visions to fit in those, right, in his vision. So mm -hmm. as he grows, we all grow. And so, uh, you know, I'm sure that you'll experience the same thing as you and Paul start attracting operators into this, um, or even trainers that want to be operators eventually, right? If you have that bigger vision, it just allows you to attract even more, you know, relevant and, and sort of, you know, better talent, if you will, over time. So, yeah, man, look, I'm really proud of you guys. As you know, um, I'll be out there next Tuesday for some filming and, and video and and apparently world's best steakhouse. Or uh, listen, if it's the best steakhouse <laughs> we'll in find Montana, out. it's got to be like one of the best in the world because you guys do meat. I'll tell you that. Um, but I'm looking forward to that. Appreciate you. Any any parting words or anything for anybody that might be any like, how about this? If you had a, one thing to say to someone who wanted to be a semi absentee owner, what would it be? It's a loaded question, but what, what would you come up with? Hiring the right people, taking your time to, you know, find that right person, make sure they're a good cultural fit, that they've got some, you know, background and experience and know what they're getting into. Um, 
you know, and I think it, it's just totally different from when so, you interview somebody and they put their best foot forward to what they're they're proven out to do, right? And so I think our deal right now is like, you know, we're we're not weighing so much on like what's your degree and how many initials do you have behind your name and those sorts of things. It's like, do you have a really good work ethic and are you a good person? And if you have those two things, like you're gonna fit pretty well within our culture. And uh, you know, I think you're gonna kick butt with us. Love it, man. Sage advice. Casey, I appreciate you. I'll see you next Tuesday. And to anyone listening, I hope you enjoyed it. Take his advice. He knows what he's doing.